Okay, good evening. Uh, today we're actually going to be talking about a couple of things. We thought it'd be fun to pair these up. Uh, a lot of this tends to be serendipitous. Every once in a while we work on a lot of projects. We usually try to space them out, but as it happens, things tend to happen together. So we thought it'd be fun to talk about a couple of projects that we've actually been working on for a little while now. One project uh, West Nile virus, I think we've been working on for a little more than a year. And another project actually started out of this group uh, a year and a half ago, sometime in November. So we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about how we're trying to get ahead of West Nile virus as it occurs in the city of Chicago so we can be more proactive. We're obviously very concerned about vector-borne illnesses and vector-borne diseases in in the city as they become a common way for diseases to spread. And West Nile virus is certainly one of the more notable. And the other one is taking a look at E. coli levels in Lake Michigan and seeing whether or not we can do a better job of forecasting when E. coli levels are going to be too high so we can warn swimmers and so they can potentially avoid those conditions. So tonight there's going to be a couple of speakers. I'm going to first turn it over to Gene Linus, who's a data scientist on my team. Uh, who's worked on the West Nile virus project, and you're going to hear from Nick Lucius, who's going to work, uh, who has been working on the E. coli project, and then I'm going to wrap some things up about how we bring it all together. So I'm going to turn over to first to Gene, and he's going to go through the West Nile virus project. So Gene, thank you. Hi. So is this mic on? Can you, everybody hear me? I need to use both. Okay. So I'm Gene Linus, I'm a data scientist at the city of Chicago, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about the West Nile virus project that we've been working on. It's to prevent West Nile. And uh, this slide is a picture of some inflamed equine brain tissue from a horse that has died from West Nile virus. And um, that's just how we're gonna start. <laughs> so, you get West Nile virus from mosquitoes. Humans, humans get it from mosquitoes, and so this is the enemy. There were a lot of surprising things I learned when I was working on this project. The first surprising thing was that uh, Chicago has a lot of West Nile virus. Uh, I remember seeing in the news, and I thought there was something that just kind of went away or was in the south or someplace else. Turns out that we actually have a lot of West Nile virus. We've had... Um, 2,300 human cases, over 2,300 human cases reported since it was a thing in 2002. And, but the other nice thing, the other nice surprising thing that I learned was that most people that contract West Nile virus have no idea that it ever happened because 80% of people approximately have absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. So for most of us, that's pretty good news. And of the people who do get sick, uh, most, most of those people just experience flu-like symptoms. Uh, the older people and, young, and uh, babies are, are more uh, vulnerable than, than, every, than everyone else. But of the people that do get sick, for the most part, it's just flu-like symptoms that you get over within a month. And it's only 1% of the people that get the really severe neuroinvasive diseases that uh, include like paralysis and really terrible nerve damage and death. That's the stuff that makes the news, um, but for the most part, it doesn't get that bad. And the other thing, the other little tidbit, is that we're in the top five states in, in the country for, for West Nile in terms of human cases reported, which was also surprising. But I'm gonna stop being a downer. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so for the most part, West Nile is a contained uh, ecosystem that, that goes between birds and mosquitoes. Mosquitoes give it to birds, Birds transmit it, uh, they move it around, and the mosquitoes pass it back and forth. And really, the human and horse cases are just spillover from this system. Um, so we're not really the carriers, and we're not really in, in the action as much as the birds. Uh, we're just kind of on the sidelines. So what do we do about it at the city of Chicago? We have three main things that we're doing. The first thing is we larvicide. This means that we drop larvicide into storm drains around the city of Chicago, and they're just little pellets that sit in the catch basin that prevent mosquito larvae from uh, becoming mosquitoes. I was, this was another surprising thing. We larvicide 150,000 storm drains, or 50,000? Uh, 
Yeah, it's 150,000 storm drains around the city. I was, I was shocked to learn that. Um, the other thing that we do, we capture mosquitoes in this gravi- gravid trap, and we do DNA testing on those, and I'll t- talk more about that. And that's really how we monitor the spread and the presence of West Nile. And if there's West Nile that's present in a certain area, we spray for it with pesticides. And that's, that's what we do. So this, this picture here, uh, this is a map of the city. And I don't know how well you can see it, but the green and red circles are where the traps are located. And the size of the trap indicates how many mosquitoes were captured and the red indicates how many had West Nile. And this is uh, from a couple weeks ago. And so you can see that it's actually not that bad this year. Uh, We're in the middle of the season right now, and it's really not everywhere. So the two main vector mosquitoes are Kulik's Pipians and Kulik's Restaurants. And we capture these mosquitoes, and we grind them up. And in, in batches of 50, and we look for the presence of West Nile DNA. That's how we find it. So the main work that I was doing in this analytical project was looking at these samples that are batches of 50 mosquitoes at a time. And you, the public, and all of us, this is where I get my data, can download the data from data.cityofchicago.org. So this is, um, oh. I want to go back to this for one second. So this also gives you an idea of the coverage of the different traps that we have. These traps stay in one place uh, in the city for throughout the summer. So this gives you kind of an idea of what the shape of the season looks like in terms of months. We start to test for it in... Um, oh, I'm sorry, can I just, I, I just have this question? Sure. How do you determine where the spots are going to be trapped? The, ep- the So I... I'm doing the predictive model. The, ep- the epidemiologists in Chicago Public Health are who put it out. They put them by f- forest preserves quite a bit and places where I think they think, and public property, so fire stations. And, and by the way, the, the portal locations, it's secret. They're, uh, it's a little bit fuzz, so those, it's not the exact location. You can't go find the traps. They're hidden. But the, um, but the, uh, so this is the shape of what our season looks like. So there's a few... Traps that are collected in May, they almost never have uh, any West Nile present. There might be a few in, in, um, in uh, June that have a, it starts to appear. But the real peak happens in August, and that's when we have the most traps out, and that's also when we're finding the most West Nile. And so the modeling process that we used, we tried random forest, gradient boosted methods, and a lot of the typical machine learning stuff. The one that actually worked for us was... Uh, I have to read it, the generalized linear mixed effect model. And what that let us do was control for the fixed effects of the location of the trap, as well as the uh, shape of the season, so that we could account for the uh, bias of the, of the actual season. And so the whole point of this was that we want to be able to uh, accurately predict if there's going to be West Nile present one week in advance uh, for the uh, for the so we can spray be, and knock down the mosquito population before it gets out of control so we can reduce the amount of spraying. And so from our uh, model, it worked out pretty well. We were able to detect 78% of the positive cases, and these are two weeks in a row cases, and we were correct 65% of the time. And it was really <clears throat> a balancing act to get to these numbers because we could have chosen a lot of different ratios for a model, a lot of different cutoff values, and we tried to pick something that was both capturing a lot of the true results but also not uh, overspraying. So the way we deliver this uh, internally within the city is using our situational awareness program, Windy Grid. So I have a saved query that shows the predictions. Uh, it auto, auto-populates for all these things. We can just share this link with... Uh, with our uh, EPIs, and this is basically the, the output of the model where the red dots are over our threshold, but you can actually see what the values are. We chose 0.39 as a threshold, so that one's 0.47, so it's over. This one's barely over. So they can get kind of an idea of the magnitude and um, of, of, the, uh, of the virus as it's around the city. And that's it.
All right, thanks a lot, uh, Tom and Gene and um, everyone here. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here, uh, honored and privileged to be standing on this side of, uh, of the podium. Um, as uh, Tom mentioned earlier, this project that I'm working on, Clear Water, uh, was born here at Shy Hack Night and in a breakout room. Uh, started with just a few people looking at uh, E. coli results and trying to create a better model. So I'm going to um, get started and tell you about our work and tell you about where we've been, where, we're, where we are, and where we hope to be going. So Chicago in the summer, it's here right now. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of the beautiful amenities we have in the city of Chicago. Uh, 26 miles of beaches. We have uh, more than 20 beaches to uh, go enjoy. Uh, people just, you know, go and suntan, have fun, and of course swim in the water. Um, we're all in here inside on a beautiful summer day, but maybe we can get out and do this sometime soon. So, uh, more fun facts. You're going to get a lot of fun facts today, and if you want more, just come and talk to Gene and I after the presentations. Um, more than 20 million people visit Chicago beaches every summer. I was astounded by that. I, I know that there's almost 3 million uh, residents in the city of Chicago. I didn't realize 20 million people visit the Chicago Park District beaches every summer. And um, with the 20 beaches that are regularly tested, there are about 150 times each year where water quality is poor enough that there's a risk where a person can develop an infection if they go swimming. Now, what does this mean? It's similar to West Nile virus, where the symptoms are flu-like. And uh, if you're a healthy adult, you probably be OK. Could be miserable for a little while. And if you're uh, young or old or otherwise uh, your immune system's compromised, it could be more serious. Um, so clearly there's a public health concern. And the Chicago Park District is tasked with monitoring the beach water quality, testing for E. coli, to make sure that residents are aware, uh, beach visitors are aware. When you go swimming, what they'll do is issue an advisory saying, hey, there's a concern, there's a risk, so that you know when you get in the water uh, what, you're, what you're taking on. That the way the park district does that, they have three main options for determining the water quality each day. Um, so the traditional way are uh, lab culture tests. The way this works is um, there, a sample's taken, it's allowed to grow in a lab, it takes a day, and the results come back a day after. So what you end up getting is always day-old data. So if you want to know what the water quality is today, um, you have to wait till tomorrow. So there's clearly a problem there when E. coli fluctuates so much. Yesterday's data doesn't tell you a whole lot. Uh, second option is relatively new. It's rapid testing. So this is DNA testing of the water samples. You can get results back in three to four hours. It's much more quickly. The problem is it's very expensive. So uh, it's not reasonable to expect that it can be done day in, day out, forever. While the Park District is currently rapid testing all the beaches, um, this is very expensive and something that is less expensive is, would be great. Um, a third way is through predictive modeling. This has been done for a number of years, uh, Chicago beaches, uh, elsewhere. Researchers have been working on predictive models. The issue with the predictive models is that the accuracy rates aren't quite there yet to be able to give regular, reliable results. So a beach manager has a set of choices and trade-offs for each one. The purpose of this project when I got started here at Shy Hack Night was to create a better predictive model, a cheap, immediate way to predict and forecast E. coli rates, water quality, and the beaches. The bottom line is that accurate predictions can prevent illnesses and save governments millions of dollars. It's just a fact. So, in addition to being a collaborative project here with Shy Hack Night, um, here at the City of Chicago, we worked with uh, students also at the University of DePaul, some interns, to do data visualizations and model enhancement. And just as a personal point, I heard some people earlier when we were going through introducing, talking about here for a career change or here to find your first career. Uh, you're in a good place for that, and I have first-hand experience. I walked into this room a year and a half ago as an attorney, and also a data nerd and a computer scientist, but someone who wanted to change careers. And I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here uh, a year and a half after walking into the E. coli room saying, I need to get 
into the latest and greatest in data science and civic hacking and everything that's going on to be able to present to you this work that involves so many people in this room's contributions. So I'm going to talk to tell you about the first model that was developed uh, starting here at Shy Hack Night. Uh, there's a couple of versions of it, but what they all pretty much did was use water sensor data, maybe, maybe not, weather sensor data, uh, the, the culture, you can see the petri dish growing there of uh, E. coli actually growing in a dish, uh, water locks, so whether they were open, um, water levels, and, and literally hundreds of other variables went in to predict, and you can see here, the E. coli level for, here's the level for one beach for the season. Now take a look at that line graph, and you can see that uh, it's, it's quite volatile. This is a beach that has one main spike in the middle of the summer. It's very hard to predict that, especially when so much is going on in the atmosphere with the sun, weather, and water sensors. So what we found was, after painstakingly working with all this data, having uh, brilliant people uh, running models and doing data exploration, looking at variables, was that it's very difficult to do much better than the predictive models that have been developed, excuse me, by beach water quality experts. We, our best model was about on par when put into a pilot and used for the year, it was about on par with what had been done in the past. So, what happens next is the work that was done to create this first model had a bunch of clues in it. Um, I'm looking around seeing faces from the people who, uh, who, who said these things when we were doing the work, which is that every time that a, a, a model would accidentally get a test result, the, the same day test results in it, which we didn't have at the time, we'd say, man, that model did really, really good, but we can't use same day test results because we don't have them. And so what that clue ended up providing for a new approach is, what if we did have same day test results? What if we bought some of those rapid tests and used them to create some sort of model? Uh, that's our new approach I'm gonna tell you about. So it works like this. We know that about five beaches out of the 20 that are regularly tested account for 56 or so percent of all the E. coli exceedances in a year. So that means that this handful of beaches are the worst offenders. They're also really hard to predict. And when we tried to create models, we were creating models for the hard to predict beaches and the low exceedance beaches that are different. So the model was trying to do two things at once and it was just kind of diverging. <clears throat> so the new approach tests those five beaches with rapid DNA testing. Th the idea is just pay for, those, pay for those tests. You're never gonna predict those beaches very well and move on. With the remaining set of beaches, we created a model to selectively choose other beaches to rapid test and get same day results to then predict the remaining beaches. And so you get a hybrid process where you're, you're, you're uh, selectively using your resources to purchase tests to predict others. It's a, it's a more economical way to do it, and the model results have shown that it is a better way to do it for creating a predictive model. We've used clustering algorithms to help choose which of those beaches that we're going to use as predictors. But I also want to show you something else we're doing on trying to choose predictors. We want to see if you can beat the model. So we've collected uh, information about the project, put it onto a website. Okay. So we've got information about the project on this website. We also have a challenge page. where You can go here and you can try to build a model that beats ours. Since essentially the model takes in predictor beaches and predicts others, you can choose the beaches. This is the page here. And uh, we've got a Shiny app embedded in here that um, the Shiny app is running our code in the background. And it's going to uh, run a random forest model, uh, run the model, validate it on a couple of years of, of historical data, and then give you um, a result that you can then put up against the city's model and see how well you do. Uh, so let's go around. Favorite beaches. All right, let's hear them. 
Edgewater? Uh, Montrose. Montrose. Uh, yeah, some of them aren't listed here. Where? North. Truly crowdsourcing a model. <laughs> one more. Rainbow. Rainbow. Uh, Rainbow's not on there. That's one of the terrible high exceedance ones that we just test and throw away. So we already have those. <laughs> What's that? 57? <laughs> All right, so let's see how we do. And uh, so if you see the little green dashed line there, you can see the model didn't quite, uh, didn't quite get up to snuff. Um, so uh, you can also take a look at how it does at individual beaches. Um, and uh, what's the question? Yeah, the dashed line is, is the city's model. Um, you can see how it did at individual beaches. You can even play around with a false positive rate. If you're comfortable saying, well, let's just kind of issue advisories even when there's no E. coli problem, you can uh, play around with that and increase that. The false alarms will then increase, right there, it increased from 14 to 37, but you got uh, some better accuracy. So you can see the trade-off. So have fun with it, build some models, um, and let us know what happens. Um, so I got a just a couple slides left. So how did the model actually do? Um, so measuring up against the, the United States Geological Service uh, surveys model uh, that was in place from 2015 to 2016, when looked at the beaches that we're working with right now, um, actually what it did was um, it, in looking at how many days the beaches, uh, that beach advisories were given to people. So let me rephrase this. Um, how often do we let people know that there's a problem in the water? Um, our model found 60 more of those days than the old model would have done. So that's 60 more days that people get accurate warnings that there's poor water quality so they can make decisions about their health. Those, those were all accurate, that is they didn't come out later than the number of false alarms. Right, those are, those are, these are accurate ones. Um, and the false alarm rate stays the same. And the fault with, with the same false alarm rate as the, uh, the model had been using in the past. How many days? There's about 2,000 beach days in a summer. Um, and of those, about 150 have high E. coli levels. You want to explain that a little bit more what a beach day is? Yeah, beach day. Great. Nomenclature of the business. So let me explain to, to what that is. Uh, uh, there are 20 beaches that are regularly tested, and there's about 100 days of summer. So what a beach day is, is a single day at a beach. In other words, every day that goes by, you've got 20 beach days that goes by. because one beach might have poor wa water quality, but another might have good water quality. So when you add up the summer, you get about 2,000 beach days. And within that, you get about 150 that have poor water quality or high E. coli. Now, in that framework, we're finding 60 more days by using this hybrid process of selectively testing uh, the worst beaches and then using other beaches to predict other beaches. Now, another way to look at uh, the metrics is just the model itself. The model that we developed, how does it stack up against the prior model that's been in place? And in using that model, uh, in looking at the beaches that we're predicting, um, we're doing three times the accuracy. So in other words, water quality advisories are issued with three times more accuracy than the prior model. This is a project that's currently under, uh, we're still experimenting. We're in the middle of 2017. But I'm, I've been very excited by the results that we're seeing. Wanted to share them with you all. And uh, finally, just wanted to say thank you to uh, the whole community here, and especially to those of you who participate on this project. Your contributions have made it what it is. Uh, thank you very much. So I want to touch on that a little bit. A couple of takeaway things at, at a kind of meta level across all these projects. Uh, if you don't remember, uh, especially if you're newer to the community, the, the city of Chicago has a tech plan. Uh, this is uh, the front of the first version of the tech plan. We've since updated it. And it's techplan.cityofchicago.org. I want to mention that because there's a couple of things here I want to wrap around. 
One of the strategies that we have is to work with civic technology innovators to develop creative solutions to city challenges. This is something that we had talked about some time ago, going back to 2011, 2012, about how can the city work with others. And early on, very early on in Shy Hack Night, before it was known as Shy Hack Night, uh, we, we talked about this. How can we work with researchers? Nick alluded to that there was a number of contributors. Can you raise your hand if you're here and you worked on the E. coli project in any way? Can you actually stand up? Stand up. This is, this is a small number. I think in the past two weeks, we've had interns and a number of researchers, I think, take jobs and move out and so they couldn't be here tonight. But we tallied it up. We kept track of this. Uh, from November till May one year, and then we had an intern over the summer, and then we had a whole entire data viz class from DePaul University work on a course project. In total, we had over 1,000 hours that was worked on this project that was not City of Chicago employees. Over 1,000 hours. This comes into the original creation of the model, talking with USGS, seeing that first model fail, and then coming up with another model, because I remember that day Kevin said, huh, all the beaches seem to move together, and after the first model failed, and we said, hey, you know, maybe we should go back and do something there. That involved a lot, and, and creating a whole new model. Nobody is uh, tackling the E. coli prediction project in the same way around the Great Lakes. And in some areas, it's quite serious. So we were able to create something entirely new because we were able to work with a whole bunch of folks. And of course, the model's open source. Nick didn't say that outright, but we have a link here that uh, at the end, so you can go see what that model is, and we're going to continue to work with USGS and others and Chicago Park District as we continue to refine and test this. But this is the punch card. I've never used this graphic on GitHub ever. I found this worthless, except for this one project. Do you spot the Tuesday nights? <laughs> right? <laughs> so you see this, you can actually see, the, see this shy hack night uh, effect for the one time that this graph is actually useful. <laughs> Uh, and this course includes all the work that, that interns later did, that Nick later did. And it's also worth n noting that Nick was hired after working on this project in part because of his ability to show his, uh, his skills in data science, especially during a career change, that's, that's quite important on this project and being able to work with him. Second, we have another strategy, what we call strategy C, uh, leverage data and new technology to make government more efficient, effective, and open. I want to mention that as part of this project, as part of the West Nile virus project, Gene was showing you some functionality of our WindyGrid project. WindyGrid uses the same open source code base of another project that is actually on GitHub called OpenGrid. As part of the West Nile virus project, to be able to meet the needs of Chicago Department of Public Health and their epidemiologists, to be able to view and look at the maps, we made improvements to OpenGrid. So when we improved that internally, to help this very particular project, that benefit, such as creating these bubble maps, being able to actually share links. I'm going to click on this link right here because it's going to take me to OpenGrid and what the actual results are for last week. So these are the results. So you can go to OpenGrid, you can go to that link, you can actually recreate this on yourself. But this was actually functionality we needed because the epidemiologists needed to create maps and just email them to each other. And so just copy and paste the URL was a way of doing it. So this is a way of making sure as we work to benefit things internally in the city of Chicago, to make ourselves more efficient with projects like these, that those sort of benefits and that sort of information is pushed out. Let alone that the data that's been talked about tonight, the West Nile virus data, is on the data portal. The uh, uh, E. coli data is on the data portal. In fact, the predictions are on the data portal. So when you take a look at some of the links that we have here, the GitHub links, chicago.github.io slash clearwater, the GitHub to the Clearwater project, the West Nile virus prediction project, and also the data portal. This is something that we continually are interested in straddling is how do we improve things internally? How can we make that data publicly available so others can access it? And then how can we make that code available so uh, people can improve upon it, so people can uh, adopt it, and people to use it? So I'll challenge you, when it comes to the Clearwater project, the, the E. coli project, uh, take a crack at it. If you think you can beat that algorithm, if you think you can do a better job, by all means, improve upon it. Submit a pull request, and if you demonstrate it does a better job, which you can because all of the data is online, we will use your code 
as part of our projects. And it's something that we've uh, constantly and will continue to do. So thank you very much for coming out. Thank you very much for listening to these couple of projects. And what are we going to do next, Chris? Questions. 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 Hi, question for Gene. Um, you mentioned that you guys treated about 150,000 uh, storm drains. Uh, do you guys use the data from the mosquito traps to guide your selection of which storm drains to treat with larvicide? No. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I don't think that, I don't think that's, the, the, actually, so the number of the mosquitoes that are actually caught in the traps is pretty small. It's a little fan that's blowing so the, the, that tub has some uh, sweet smelling stuff in it that the mosquitoes go to. And then the fan just blows them up into that bag. And so they only collect like a really active trap only collects like 250. Most of them only collect like 20. So it's just, it really is a very random sample. And I don't think it's indicative of the total mosquito population really. And by the way, they also do not test, trap, or report or spray for nuisance mosquitoes. Kulix pipians and Kulix restaurants don't bite humans very often. They're mostly bird eaters. They don't bite humans until, for whatever reason, late in the season. And humans are not their first choice. So it's, it really is spillover. Thank you. Um, have you, uh, between these two projects, have you gathered any information on the amount of people's like live livelihoods that you've changed? Like how many people have not gotten sick or have not died from them? You know, it's, it's a good question. Uh, it's hard to track down. We tend to work on projects, it seems, where there's a, a severe amount of under-reporting uh, because it's often confused. So E. coli, when you're in Lake Michigan, if you get sick, uh, it's hard to track down whether or not it was from the lake from something you ate or just simply being sick or being out in the sun all day. Same thing with West Nile virus. Certainly the severe cases uh, get reported to us, but when the symptoms are flu-like symptoms, when there might not be any symptoms at all, it's really hard for us to trace down how much it is. So a lot of our modeling, our accuracy is how often we actually write and knowing that that's gonna infer back to people who are being impacted. And of course, just the large numbers. So the, the number of people going to the beach, the, the number of people that are walking around, especially uh, children that we're concerned about that might get bit by mosquitoes. We know it's a large number, but it's hard for us to trace down what it is. Same thing when we worked on e uh, restaurant predictions, it's hard for us to tell me people got sick. Actually though, I noticed something when I was preparing these slides, it's pretty interesting. So 2012 was our banner worst year for West Nile in the city of Chicago. We had quite a few human cases. 2016 was actually almost exactly as bad in terms of the quantity of West Nile infections in mosquitoes. And the human cases were a lot lower. So I kind of think that the spraying and the, and the treatment, things that have been put in place since 2012 did help. But it's pretty anecdotal and it's not, it's not some giant statistical study. A uh, follow-up question from the interwebs. Uh, Alex uh, Sobel wanted to know if we knew how many people died from West Nile each year. Do you have that? I should top know hand? that. I don't. I don't have that. It's it's something like I think there were five people last year or ten. It's a pretty deaths. Fortunately, is a pretty low number. The neuroinvasive is less than one percent of that ten percent, and uh, so there are eight hundred and fifty-three cases in two thousand two. Last year, there were, um, I think there were 90 cases. And this year so far, there have only been two cases in Will County and uh, none in Cook County, and the one next to Will County, whatever that is. Uh, other questions? Um, are, you, are you guys looking into other vector-borne diseases um, in terms of using predictive analytics to like Zika, I know we're really far up north, but that's been a hot topic, so just wondering. Uh, so, I mean, frankly, uh, us looking at this vector-borne disease props us very well for us to be able to look at future uh, potential vector-borne diseases. Now, fortunately, in the, in the, where we're at, we have, as you guys have learned, much more about mosquito uh, species than I think you would have cared to, uh, <laughs> and also looked at some gnarly photos today. Uh, fortunately, we have a species mistype that helps us not have Zika here. Uh, the, the main carrier for Zika is not a mosquito that only goes to about St. Louis, which is not that far away. 
Uh, but we, by, by looking at this data, by having these sort of statistical models, we're going to be better prepared to be able to tackle those if something comes up, let alone if it's Zika, if it's something else that might pop up down the road. But we know vector-borne diseases is a, a, a potential issue, will continue to be a potential issue for humans, and we are preparing ourselves to be able to handle that. Thank you, guys. I have, I have a question. Um, why West Nile? Virus, um, you guys have talked about a lot of the resources you put in. It's costing a lot of money. Um, is this the biggest health crisis that Chicago's facing, or um, why specifically this problem? Uh, it's one of the things that we have to take care of. Uh, I'll give you an example, another project that we've been actively working on for some time as well, that I think will be done here soon, uh, is uh, lead paint poisoning. Uh, West Nile virus is another thing where there's teams of people going to work on of, of where to spray. It's also very sensitive, too, where to spray. And spraying is a very sensitive topic. So the better job that we can do both of getting ahead of the problem and also by taking care of the issue, but not overspraying at the same time as well, is a careful balance that we need to, uh, to constantly face. Also, when we take a look at the affected populations, we're, of course, going to be very attuned to problems that primarily impact children. That's also the lead project. Uh, and older individuals who are just susceptible to certain diseases more than anybody else. Uh, so it's one of the many public health projects that we've worked on in the past and will continue to work on going forward. Uh, uh, but it is something that really impacts us all. Thank you. This may be more of like a science-y question, but uh, I didn't get in the beginning of the, the uh, presentation of like why we like can predict where like the E. coli are in the beaches and like if the USGS says it's all right, and we're just like saying there's more beach days, like how does the predictive model like help? Or like where, like where in science does that come from, I guess, of predicting? Uh, really good question. And in fact, I think what we did, I'm gonna speak for you on this one, Nick. I think we gave up on science. Uh, and and I, let me rephrase it like this. Early on, Nick was talking about how we we're trying to account for water, we're trying to account for levels, we we're accounting for this and we're accounting for that. Because somewhere in our model, we're trying to imagine ourselves, we're trying to imagine that this big ecosystem, this, this massive lake, we're trying to pick up the factors that give, leads to the presence of, of E. coli, which a lot of it's coming from runoff or from, from birds dropping, uh, dropping droppings into the lake, runoff into, into the lake from uh, garbage and, and waste on the beaches. And that, the model just was not very stable. Some summers would be great, other summers would be terrible, and some summers would be great again. And obviously we're missing information. The, the, the statistical model is too complicated for what we are trying to tackle. So the trick was, was more of information theory, which is that we had some of these test results that could be fairly immediately available. And those test results, imagine you go to Montrose or something like that, and you have this very rapid test result, and you see what the results are that day. That sensor is picking up whatever information is happening within the beaches. We've since have gone away. We don't control for any other variables. We just look for correlation between the beaches. So we've kind of just said, okay, look, we don't know what it is, but this sensor is picking up information about the condition of the water that day. This sensor is often correlated with other beaches as well. And so we're going to use that correlation to figure out whether inf information is there and try to spill it over to the next beach. So we said, look, we can't model whatever scientifically is happening there. That, that's too, too tough of a challenge, or obviously we're just completely missing it. So we end around and we found a more efficient predictive way that seems to predict really well using this sort of information theory approach. Anything else? No, you just described my whole life, too. Just <laughs> <laughs> Figure out another way around. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other questions? What, what roles or responsibilities does a team have to take on to be successful in a data science project like this? Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to uh, first Nick and then Gene on that one. Well, um, it's, it's quite a vast amount of roles and responsibilities. Um, First and foremost, what these projects tend to be are collaborative, um, you know, like we've talked about before. So um, working with other people in a collaborative framework requires a, a lot of teamwork and a lot of, um, of understanding and empathy. Um, so, you know, it's big there. Another is that as data scientists, what we end up doing is a lot of data cleaning and a lot of data engineering. So, uh, you know, we jump from working with others, talking with clients, uh, 
drafting communications and visualizations to actually doing data science type projects. Um, I don't know, Gene, if you have anything you want to add. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of the preparation. It's a lot of the stuff you don't think about. I mean, it's connecting to databases. It's figuring out how to run something on a CentOS or on a different type of uh, operating system. It's um, being a jack of all trades. You know, it's downloading the you know Beckna to font or something like that. And um, you know, it's um, yeah. But there's a lot of collaboration. I'll tell you what. I did a lot of the project before Nick came here, and it's been great to have you know, to have Nick on the team and uh, have another R developer to, uh, you know, share the load and ask questions to, so. And I'll add this as well, because uh, we experienced, I think, with both projects, is, is explore, uh, run your inquiries through, and when it's really starting to look like it's not working, take a step back, look at the evidence, and then pivot if need to. Uh, e. coli is a great example of that. We hit hiccups every once in a while with West Nile virus where we thought something was there. And so we were, ab were able to figure out, okay, making sure that we're meeting need, meet the client's need, the Department of Public Health, Chicago Park District, uh, and then make sure we're pivoting, always make sure we're, uh, we're responding to what people need at the end of the day. And I think that's a great place to close out. Thank you so much.